This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Do you want to make your creative project easier? Use WeTransfer. It is so easy. There's no sign-in, no offer codes, no password to forget. Just upload, send, and get back to making what it is you make. 40 million people use this service. So in this spirit, we're skipping the rest of this 60-second ad and getting right back to the podcast. WeTransfer.com. You make we transfer. I love this service. Now, here we go. Yes, yes, yes. 300 episodes. Welcome to it. I'm Ray Harkins. I'm so excited because it's, a, it's 300 episodes. I was about to say 100. No, we, we passed that a long time ago. 300 episodes. Why does this feel momentous? It's because it's 300. <laughs> That is a lot of anything. You got 300 records, you got 300 video games, like that's a lot of stuff. And that's exactly what I have collected here with the help of you fine people. And who do I have on the show today? Well, if you are a person that reads, you already know. But if you wanted this moment to crescendo into a a grand announcement, that's what you're getting. Chris Taylor from page 99. Holy crap. I never thought I'd be saying that because uh, I don't know. There's just certain people who I was like. Oh yeah, I'm wh- like, why would anybody in Page 99 come on my podcast? Like, they're a total, you know, vaulted, legendary band within the context of our beautiful independent music scene. And um, yeah, lo and behold, he popped up on Instagram with his art because he is uh, focused on that full time. And he, if you are not familiar with his art, you have to dive in. So yeah, just Google Chris Taylor and you'll be able to find his Instagram. That's what I would uh, highly suggest you you follow. But he is the vocalist for Page 99, the incredible punk rock hardcore gypsy band made up of 175,000 members of course i'm exaggerating but they uh yeah they they traveled around like a uh, you know band of pirates and uh i was unfortunately never able to see them in their original incarnation in the time they were touring which is seems insane but every time they came through i was out of town and uh it sucks because i really really enjoyed this band and i think if i were to have seen them my love for them would have grown deeper because that's what happened with all of those bands of that genre, whether it was Orchid, whether it was, uh, you know, volume 11, like so many bands that just like ping pong around in my head. And more specifically at this one particular venue called the PCH club here in Southern California, I just saw so many great bands of this ilk and, uh, yeah, I just, I'm bummed. I never saw page 99, but Chris is a great hang, great chat. And, uh, yeah, we're gonna bring that to you in a moment, but so please leave a review. If you have been listening to this show for longer than a couple months, just, just dive into Apple podcasts, give a review, give some stars. I would really appreciate that. Cause like I said, I've explained it before. I'm not going to go in great detail on it, but, but, uh, yeah, it just helps the show. So can you do that? Please do that. And our great, great friends in Rockabilia want you to buy cool band merch. Okay. And not just cool band merch, officially licensed band merch. And I want to give you 15% by using the promo code PC Jabberjaw. Okay. That is the network that we are part of. And uh, they're going to give you 15% off of whatever piece of merch you buy. They got half a million things floating around their website. They have so much cool stuff. Like I, I would actually really encourage you to try to like find a band that has, you know, some like old merch hidden in the corner of their warehouse. Cause I definitely have done that. <laughs> And it's fun. So uh, I challenge you to do that. Like just find some, you know, band that is like completely irrelevant to most people's eyes, but you ride hard for and you'll find a piece of merch there more likely than not, because I definitely have. So Rockabilia, thank you very much for hanging out on the show as you always do recently. And uh, I appreciate that. And you're, you're going to notice, like I've mentioned before, there are a, uh, a decent amount of sponsors and people that are coming on board this show. The reason that I am able to do this to you on a week to week basis for absolutely free is because of these sponsors and because of the people who believe in this show. And frankly, the only reason why they're on the show is because I have said yes. I have said yes, I will endorse for this thing. Yes, I've tried this thing. I like it. And uh, yeah, it's essentially, you know, word of mouth. That's how this stuff is passed around. I'm not just being like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I really like this food service thing or blah, blah, blah. I like this mattress thing because I, I, you know, I've never slept on it or whatever. I'm just trying to make some cash. That's not true for for me and it's not true for this show. So if I'm putting it in front of you, there's a reason that I'm putting it in front of you. Okay. I want you to know that. Okay. 
But um, yeah, and what else? What else do I got going on? Taken, taken, taken. We're prepping for release at the end of this month, and uh, you should you can find our first song out there. It's called Regret, and you can find it on any streaming service or YouTube or whatever. Thank you to all the kind words of people that have said nice things about it. And even if you hate it, totally fine. I get it. <laughs> that's where that's where taking lies in most people's lives. So understandable. And then um, yeah, that's all. I just want to dive right into Chris because this is a very long, lengthy conversation. He, uh, yeah, I can tell he's wrestling around with uh, certain ideas of what it's like to play in a band and what it's like to reunite under um, circumstances that they never could have anticipated in regards to just like how many people really, really, really enjoy page 99. So anyways, that's that. Here is the conversation with Chris and strap in. It's a long one. 300 episodes. That's incredible. Thank you. All right. Here's Chris. Hey, real talk before we start this episode, we lose so many people to opioid addictions. Drug abuse is a huge problem amongst our community of musicians and recovery isn't a one size fits all. The American Addiction Center's customized treatment to fit individual needs with evidence-based practices and innovative patient care technology. This is so incredibly important today. So if you are ready to get help or you know someone that needs help, call American Addiction Centers at 888-867-1882. It's available 24-7 and please don't wait until it's too late. I have dealt with addiction in my family. This is a real deal. I cannot endorse this enough. Call American Addiction Centers now, okay? Now, on with the show. I live in Southern California, and uh, you know I'm I'm in my late 30s. So, uh, but for whatever reason, I never saw Page 99, which makes me mad because like I saw, you know, basically all the bands that you toured with, from you know Majority Rule to you know uh, basically everybody that existed in that scene at the time. Um, but all the contemporaries, exactly, exactly, and I, and I loved all of it. You know, Orchid, everything else. You know that that was even you know ten times smaller than what you guys were as far as your national touring reputation preceded you. But um, did you like as you guys toured out west? Like, did you like coming out to the west coast? Because I know some bands that you know do that. Like they, uh, you know, they're, they're like, oh well, the shows will you know be great once we get kind of through the Midwest or whatever, and then we get to the the west uh-huh. coast. Um, did you enjoy coming out west? Oh yeah, I mean, I think co- collectively, you know, the way we. Th- I think we started as a band, I think within a few months, Page I-9 was playing, I forget the name of the fest, I wish my brother was here. We were playing a fest with Benam and Dystopia and fucking Nuth Grush and like all these like great California bands. Just by proxy of like, you know, we started as a band in a like literally no man's land. We're too far outside of any major city for there to be much influence or anything. So, uh, just by weird fucking cosmic, like circumstance, uh, the grind father, uh, Richard Johnson from enemy soil and J.R. Hayes and, uh, Brian Harvey of pig destroyer live in Sterling. And we were all hanging out off and on through high school and kind of like separately going through music, but not really realizing that each other were doing stuff or whatever. And, and I guess we started right around the same time pig destroyer started and, and through like Scott Hall, um, who had all of these like friends all over. He was, I mean, both him and Richard Johnson were these, they're like our age now to like the kids going around touring right now, you know, like they were these, huge resources with tons of people they they knew it was all grindcore and you know power violence or crust punk or whatever people called it back then but yeah we so we we got we we all spent you know whatever ridiculously low amount of money we had back then you know pay to play and flew out to california to play this fest because they were like, yeah, you can play if you want. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we, we booked like, I think four shows around it and all, uh, with news crush and, and all jumped in this like little, we split up in these two sedans. 
and crammed a bunch of instruments in it. And one of us had a sitting on a tire. The other one's got a emergency brake up his ass. And, you know, we, we, it's funny to think about that now. Like, I don't think one single, you know, I don't think one of us would, would agree to do that trip again, but, but I think uh, by and large, uh, we page I nine in those days and, and all of those bands for at least all my twenties, uh, you know, the whole goal is to get, you know, we page I nine did probably four t- tours a year. And, and the one in the summer was almost always four to six weeks. And it was, it was always a loop, you know, you, you go the, uh, uh, the the hottest part you go north, you know, or, you know what I'm saying. Of the yep. summer, you go, you started off going cool, and there's just you know these rules that started to form for us. And throughout that five years, it was just a regu- pretty regular circuit. And yeah, I mean, I mean, you go all over the country. I mean, at this time, I, I don't know how many tours I've been on, something like thirty or or something like that. U.S. and I, you know, I. I have more of a familiarity affinity and lots and lots of friends that are over on that side of the country. And generally speaking, probably, you know, you know how certain people seem to kind of fit a city. Sometimes I think I'd probably do better out on that, that coast. Honestly, I've always felt that felt a little bit more um, like there were my people out there, but that said, you know, it, I don't enjoy it. You know, I wouldn't be able to do the San Diego thing. I need winners. I need like bullheaded assholes around to kind of (laughs) put you you in check. uh, (laughs) Yeah. My, I I don't want to get too far off base of like, you know, like how, you know, disgusting and real this world is, you know, like I I don't want to pretend like it's not there. I'm not saying that, that West people on the West coast do that. I'm just saying that, uh, if I was over there, I might, I might just go ahead and be like, all right, well, I'm fucking a uh, Bushman now and I'm fucking, you know, like meditate for half the day and then, you know, right. uh, start friction fires and build shelters in the desert or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, totally. We, Which it, would be great. Uh, yeah. Well, it is, I mean, it is easy to retreat to that idea of, you know, California lifestyle of being, you know, in your own bubble, whatever that may mean, whether that's, you know, suburb life, whether that's, you know, I'm going to retreat out to the desert, what you're talking about. Like it's, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I granted, I guess it's easy to do that in, you know, many different parts of the country, but California has that tendency just because it is of a lower intensity level than most major metropolitan areas. So yeah, I totally understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. I think, you know, like, especially being a 20 year old or, or whatever, when I first got there, it was culture shock. I was like, damn, you know, like people were like, do you need a ride? Like I remember (laughs) so many times people like, you know, offering rides, you know, and that just would not fucking happen anywhere from DC up to New York. I mean, maybe in the South, but, but, you know, I mean, people don't even slow down for you in a crosswalk, but over there, you know, you know, I used to make fun of it, you know, later on, like, uh, it's a state of mind, man, California. Yeah, of course. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's real too. I mean, like there's a couple of my friends and that's why I mentioned, you know, part of me thinks I would do well out there. There's a couple of my friends that <laughs> they're more intuitive, sensitive people like me. And, and I feel like that's a uh, environment. I think, you know, I think, uh, psychically, you know, like, we uh, we unconsciously absorb the energy of of our environment, and that includes people and attitudes and ideas and everything like that. Yeah, you know, if you if you have by and large a populace that's you know you know ten percent more altruistic, uh, it's gonna it's gonna kind of affect you know plenty of research says you know uh, the psychology you know like you're people emulate each other they they don't even realize that they start picking up little parts and if you want hey if you want to stop doing mess and uh having a ton of kids uh maybe hang out with different people and that sounds crazy but uh yeah but it's called it's called it's called mirroring (laughs) right mirror neurons it's a i read a whole book about uh about you know people you watch like a you watch a boxing match and you kind of twitch with the hits or, or you, or you're 
watching the what's that the luge or whatever in the winter olympics where the, the bobsled you're yep. like kind of turning with it or whatever <laughs> right yeah so it's, it's natural for us to like you know uh to emulate that and so i think by and large i think i've always been been readily tempted uh by uh the left coast yeah for sure or uh it's, it seems more compatible totally totally but the, as far as the bands go i mean we so i would say we enjoyed every everything mm. yeah <laughs> we're, we're even out in the middle of nowhere it was like a field trip so i the, the west coast was just more fun because there was more people and more things to do but yeah we had fun in parking lots and you know yeah, you made you made the be- yeah you made the best of whatever situation you were in because you know there was there was little to no pressure in your own head. Yeah, yeah, yeah and there was like twelve of us almost every time. So <laughs> totally, you know, with that many people, it just was like a field trip. It it just felt goofy, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, kind of reflecting on you as a person, were um, were you born and raised in Sterling, or did you you know did you come up in another I guess kind of <laughs> suburb ish area um, of the uh, the Maryland area, the Maryland Virginia it was, area? It was it was funny. Uh, it was uh, uh, Fairfax, Virginia to to Canton, Ohio to Virginia Beach to Stafford, Virginia, which is basically just farms, and then. Stafford to Reston, which is more metro Northern Virginia, closer to the DC. And then, um, and then my mom met my stepdad and they, we all moved to Sterling then somewhere around 84 when me and Mike were like five and six. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say race. I, my earliest memories are out in Stafford in the farm. I had this fucking cool ass memory of, uh, of my uncle trying to get a snake out of the tree with, with a pitchfork. <laughs> and it, he was all silhouetted against like sort of a wheat field sunset. And, uh, that's the mem- that's the very first one I have, but that, uh, shortly after I actually remember the fight my mom and aunt got into when we went to rest. And so from resting on, I pretty much recall everything. So I, I kind of consider myself born and raised here, but, yeah. Just by, uh, by way of my memories, not, uh, not technically. Yeah, sure. Well, it makes sense because yeah, you, you know, you can move around a ton before you're, you know, whatever, six or seven. And you only, ha- you only have these like fleeting memories of like, oh, I think I remember something like that, but yeah. So, right. and, and we're, you're flashes. right. Right. And you're, uh, is it just like you and your brother in the house or do you have other siblings? It's just me and Mike, but we found out later by the time we were both 32, we found out we have um, two other brothers and a uh, younger sister. Okay. But that was the, so that there, and all of our other siblings are half siblings, but, uh, but just recently I've kind of re sort of ma- formed relationships with them. Uh, my little sister's in high school, first year of high school. Now my other little brother, Sean is in a uh, college at a uh, university of Illinois. And then, Believe it or not, my other younger brother, his name is Mike, too. <laughs> Whoa. He was adopted. Um, but we reconvened with him, and he's he's just like us. It's weird. He's the closest to us in age. and Well, they're all kind of like us. They're either introverts or goths or weirdos or freaks. But our, our uh, closest age brother, our other brother, Mike, is he's a film student, and he makes all these Brian Eno tripped out soundscapes like on um you know synthetically with synths and shit like that so he's i mean i i don't hang out with him enough i've only met him three times but we like text a lot you know like songs and things you know just trying to catch up sure but um that's cool but it's it's pretty amazing to it's like a friend or an acquaintance that you meet that you feel really kind of an affinity for but then you know, after hanging out with them or somewhere while you're hanging out with you, you're like, this is my brother. <laughs> right. This is my blood. This like, is, yeah. And it's kind of weird. I mean, you start to see little parts of yourself in them and their behaviors and stuff. And, you know, biology is a weird thing. And, uh, but yeah, it, it, it makes for really, you know, a great way to meet a stranger. You probably need to take better care of yourself, right? Sexual performance issues are more common than you think. This service is 
awesome. It's called fourhims.com. It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness, all for men. It's got medical grade solutions, real doctors, and well-known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions that can help you combat all of these things, including ED, erectile dysfunction for those of you that aren't in the medical know. Forhims.com offers men easier and more affordable access to all the prescriptions, products, and medical advice that every single one of us probably needs. These aren't herbal supplements. These are prescription solutions backed by science. And there's no waiting room. You can schedule all this stuff in advance on this website. And you can save hours by answering a few quick questions. Then a doctor will review and prescribe you everything you need. And it'll be sent to your door. Order now. And listeners for this show get the first month for just $5. While supplies last, of course. You can see website for the full details. And this would cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. So go to fourhymns.com slash words ed. That's W O R D S E D. So fourhymns.com, which is F O R H I M S dot com slash words ed. This service is awesome because so many dudes are like, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor, whatever. I'll lose my hair. Like, I'll have like the worst looking skin possible. Like, you know, I'm not going to be uh, that, that cool in bed. No, do, do this. Your life will become better for hymns.com and get five dollars for your first month okay please do that for hymns.com slash words ed and enjoy like you mentioned you know once you guys kind of settled down in sterling as far as you know your mom meeting your stepdad and everything like that um like what yeah. is your relationship with your your stepfather cool or was it kind of you know a, a little bit rocky as i know that those things have a tendency to be when there is you know you're not my dad sort of scenario not saying that you enacted that but <laughs> Right. Well, no, that's exactly what it was, but you know, it took a little while. I think we were, this is a long story, but I think we were readily willing to accept him at first. Cause it was like around Christmas when he, when he jumped into the, into the unit and, uh, man, he just loaded us up with big wheels. Oh, I mean, nice. we were poor. So yeah. We're, we were all in like a, the three of us slept in one bed in a one bedroom, uh, condo in Reston. And, uh, you know, I mean, my mom literally put bowls over her head to save some money on the haircut. Like, you know, we were, it was just classic. I wouldn't say white trash because we were, we were, you know, we were clean, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> and not, dr- you know, parental figures weren't drunks or something. But I would argue that later on we turned a little bit into white trash just by choice. And also because we went to a more rural place after after he joined in. But uh i regress um no yeah it was it was a tumultuous uh he, he was a military guy he um his dad was cruel um he had a a wife and children that that uh, i know nothing about even to this day um and um you know he never drank but he was just incredibly angry and you know when i went to his family reunion and met his dad my step grandfather or whatever for the first time he was just he had one leg because of gangrene and he was just he just was a ball of hate he was Whoa. just cursing he was cussing like little kids they were putting kids on his lap to take reunion pictures and he was cussing the kids he was cussing everybody <laughs> else i got pictures of him just screaming you know and i think when you're a teenager you know or when you're a kid you know an adult a young adolescent all the way through teen years, I mean, there's really no way to understand somebody that is just angry, you know, like, uh, if it doesn't come from anywhere, mm-hmm. it has no source that, that is discernible to you. Then I think what, what you do is you sort of lash out in your own way, either start punishing yourself or, you know, or whatever. And, but he was brutal, man. He, uh, he whooped us. He, we had to cut switches in the backyard. And if we brought a little one back, he'd break it on us. And then, cut other ones he did the he did coat hanger whippings and he did uh belts with the buckle on he got on top of my brother once uh, uh ground and pound position and mm-hmm. he was punching him you know so he it wasn't until somewhere around mike mike we were just starting our first band and mike finally hit him back and i don't think he hit either one of us after that but uh 
But now he's got dialysis. I've actually, I live in the house I grew up in right now because I, um, he's on home dialysis and he's almost died like two times, uh, the past, in the past year. Or so he's been hospitalized once for MRSA and once for, uh, pneumonia. Mm-hmm. But on top of it, his kidneys fail, both of them. So, and he's so old, he's the last person on the list for a donor and, um, and he could, you know, he gets his whole, he plugs his body up to this machine and basically it works as his kidneys filters every ounce of blood he has out of him and through a machine filter and then back into him. He gets cold as hell. You know, he's lost a ton of weight. He's lost, and he years ago lost all of his vitriol. I don't know, just the domestic life. You know, he used to be Republican. My mom turned him Democrat. Democrat. He's, he's really come a long way. Right, right. Somewhere in my teen years, like I was just, why are you so mad? Do you regret? Do you regret like taking, you know, taking us in or marrying mom? Do you feel like you left a better life, you know, when you when you joined us or or what? And I and I described to him why he was yelling at me. I described to him what it was like when it was just me, Mike, and mom. I was like, we used to fall asleep to Dallas, like in one bed. We loved each other. We didn't argue. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was like, you know, you're here and I don't think you like it. Do you like it? And you could tell he was like, you know, I've written plenty of songs about him. One of the Pygmy List songs has this thing. You could tell he was like a little bit like a train just slowing down, like blowing the steam out or something. And uh, and literally he just opened up to me. He's like, man, I used to go camping. And <laughs> he, he became a friend and or he started talking to me like one where, mm-hmm. you know, it was sort of man to man I was finally old enough and didn't react to him instead of because that's how it always incited it was he's kind of childlike in that way where he, if you if you started getting it was like chum in the water or blood in the water so he gets like you know you can smell it and he just starts going crazy too and you do and then before you know it it's just a mess but I was just calm and just asked him questions about how he felt <laughs> it was like a shrink uh, but but yeah, and and I think slowly over those years, at least with me, uh, after that, he really started becoming more like looking at me as more as like maybe I maybe I'm, you know, not his mistake or something. Yeah, you know? you're like you're just- <laughs> you're a worth you're a worthwhile human being to have a discussion with. You know, like it's not just this. Uh, yeah, yeah. It does. I mean, um, y- yeah. you lay out a very important scenario in which I, you know, I think everybody goes through at some point where you flip from being this, you know, you know, obstinate child or a child into someone that you can have, you know, a discussion with and, you know, either not be on the same level, but like you said, they, there, there's a understanding there that isn't there when you're, you know, 10 years old or whatever and disobeying them. So mm. that's, mm-hmm. it's, it's awesome that it's awesome that he was able to get to that point. Cause some people, I mean, you know, you hear about those stories of, you know, people on their deathbed being like, I'm so sorry. I was never close to you. I never expressed my, it's like, mm-hmm. Oh man, some people are just too stubborn. They don't ever get there. Yeah. No. And I feel, I, I count blood. I feel in, eternally grateful for my strokes of luck. Cause I feel like, you know, I moved back here to help him, you know, like to help my mom retired so she could help nurse him. Cause she had to do all the needles and they have medical supplies show up at the house uh, pretty much daily that requires breaking down of boxes that honestly at both of their ages, if, if, if I'm not here, that, that stuff gets piled up to the point where they have to hire someone to come and like, you know, and I'm just like, fuck that. You know, I was, all my roommates moved out at the same time. He got real sick. So I just came back. It was like two birds of one stone. I'm saving money and, and helping them out. Cause I, you know, and also, you know, like we were talking about earlier, something just happens and it triggers you towards this. It's a trigger in a good way. Like, a almost like the, uh, you're guided there in a, in a way or something like, uh, I had this, this 400 condo luxury condominium maintenance job that was just working me. Like I, I did on call. So, somebody could take a shit at 3 a.m. and I would have to go and, and unclog their toilet. You know, like they, they'd call me. <laughs> if I wake up, put my fucking uniform on and go and unclog the toilet. So I did that for like a year 
And it's just like, you know, there's part of me, I, I took it so I could learn appliances and household things, honestly, to help people I know and myself out. If I ever get a home and et cetera, et cetera, it's good for side jobs, et cetera. And, uh, so, you know, I just really wanted it to learn water heaters and, and washer dryers and microwaves and refrigerators. And, you know, cause I already know plumbing and electrical and walls and building codes and stuff, but I didn't know any appliances. So I was like, I'll just do this for a little bit. Touring's going to get in the way anyway, eventually. And, um, you know, and I'll move on, but like, it just really sunk in. I was like, man, I do not want to make some shithead their money anymore. I just don't want to do that. Like, and right around that time, all my roommates left that house and then Walt got sick and I'm just like, all right, well, and then I just kind of took off for a long time. Like, you know, I played a bunch of music really, but, uh, it didn't settle in until like, you know, a couple of months ago to like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to start in earnest, like trying to not even trying to just, just being the, the, or giving the attention and, uh, and, um, attend to like, uh, the, the art part of my life that I've ignored for so long or whatever. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I like, I going back to your pops and, and, or, or just in general, like I, I feel like I, I lucked out because he taught me, you know, he taught me that, like, well, he taught me what, like, hell looks like as a child. Sure. <laughs> and I really feel like, feel like I can relate to a lot of people now and and, and quality people. I, I find that the people that go through a lot and a lot of times have this level of depth to them that, well, I think it's because of the way I am. It just really interests me. And I... And I'm more engaged with those people. And uh, I feel like my experiences help me in understanding them and possibly helping them. But also, um, he also gave me later in his life uh, the the very elusive fact that sometimes um, somebody who seems evil is actually just a person, uh, a victim of some circumstance that that put him in that mind frame that that looks so convincingly unholy or something but really it's a human being and we just have we have the capacity for all of that joy and hate all at, all at once and i just see I, I think i see that in people a little bit more than other people and it makes me a bit more tolerant and um you know i appreciate you know a, a, a greater swath of our uh disgusting horde of humanity <laughs> but in a good way you know i mean i know what we are but but at the same time, you know, uh, none of us really can do anything about it. You know, I mean, unless everybody sort of decides, wait, 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 we're having way too many fucking babies. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> we're pumping. We yeah. All these babies for yeah. the species to stay alive. Cause there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. We're, 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 uh, we're at, we're at maximum capacity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. so, no one's going to come to that conclusion. I don't see that happening. So no, not at all. you gotta be, there's gotta be, if there isn't going to be a, a, a reduction in overall population, there needs to be a reduction in uh, intolerance towards the population because there, those two things aren't compatible. Yep. You can't, you know, you can change one, your tolerance, you can't change the other, how many people are, are around you, you know? So yeah, don't know, totally. I think Walt, I think, you know, Walt and my upbringing and everything really, you know, highlighted that. So I feel fortunate. I know a lot of people have felt bad for me, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people, you know, or, you know, in my position would wish something different for something different, but ultimately I've, at this age, I feel like I've seen a lot of walks of life and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy about where, you know, where I ended up. You never get to choose. So yeah, totally. I, I'm kind of cool with where, where mine was. Right. You have a greater understanding now. So that's cool. Um, yeah. the, th- the, the thing that I always, uh, you know, found interesting, uh, something that you actually mentioned in there in regards to the fact that, you know, you, you wouldn't, uh, you know, completely classify yourself as, you know, white trash, but the, you know, the, the notion that th- there was something inherently 
always weird about page 99, not only because sonically you guys threw kind of everything at people, but then the fact that you toured, you know, as like 97 people in a van <laughs> and you did all these things, you did all these things that were very, very unconventional. Um, and it, it served your guys' purpose, but like everything seemed, uh, at least to the outsider's perspective, deliberate from, you know, the way that you named every record as a document and, you know, the fact that you did have, um, so many people collaboratively contributing to the band. Um, I guess, you know, was a lot of that deliberate or was a lot of that just basically kind of happenstance, you guys figuring it out as you were going along? Um, well, everything, everything is usually some reaction to another thing. And Sure. But I think I would say, you know, deliberate insofar as like how cognizant we could be of a certain situation. But, but yeah, I mean, um, document and titling documents was was very intentional i think uh specifically you know the story with that just is is uh we did a number of bands before page i and nine that kind of did little tapes and things and and had you know sort of uh well you know but pre-internet a loose catalog just kind of floating around there around town and some people had them and some people you know like you know nothing was anything more than 50 or 75 or whatever. And, um, I think Mike, you know, from the get go, I think all of us just love continuity and records. I mean, I think the, at least anybody who was concerned with the aesthetic of the band, which is to say me, my brother, uh, Johnny and later Brandon or something, but like, um, you know, we all liked continuity and records the way, Misfits always use Pusshead or, or Black Flag always use R- Raymond Pettibone or, um, and, uh, and we just, we also, you know, like we like one thread, like the Jesus lizard, every record is a four letter word. And we liked one thread kind of tying every record together. So that was the, the, you know, the origin of, of the document ideas, just sort of say it, what, what it is. This is, you know, this is to document this band and we're going to be, you know, we're going to make a lot of shit. So let's just do numbers, you know, like, and, and I thought that was great because we didn't have to worry about these concepts. Every record, we let the music be the concept or whatever, you know, sometimes you're, you know, at least with Pygmy Lush, you're arbitrarily almost uh, coming up with another band name for your album title and, and blah, blah, blah. And we did, a, I think a lot of the, heavy lifting for the uh, concept or aesthetic of it with song titles and artwork and stuff like that. But, uh, but you know, uh, the, the membership, you know, I guess that's the thing. I mean, I think we're out here in the sticks and I think con- some conventional things, I think the way we looked uh, was, uh, was another thing, you know, like uh, there, there's just nothing cool about us. Um, and also, I think, um, you know, having eight members, I, I just don't think there was anything, you know, I'm coming to realize these days how important it is, you know, like how you appear to people or something, but, uh, yeah. or how important it seems to people. But, um, but, uh, you know, and, and what are, what is someone going to say, you know, if, if you have eight members, you know, no one's, it's funny, I don't feel like we talked that much about our band, you know, I mean, we did in these goofy ways, but we just, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of seriousness about it. And so I feel like the extra members is just, there was no other bands around saying, don't do that or, or a scene frowning down upon us, uh, you know, to, to do whatever we wanted. So when, you know, another friend started being like, man, you guys fucking rule or something like, and they (laughs) also play guitar and they're just hanging out with us. They're just like, play with us, bring your amp and let's do it next Saturday. And then they come and it sounds even bigger and crazier and we're like okay and then you know uh i think the second base was added because uh the guy we were you know he's in city of caterpillar but the at the time the guy we were trying to rent the band from was like i'll only rent it if you let me pay, play bass on the tour and it was brandon <laughs> and so that so we're like okay there's two bases that started right there and we just never went back to one base right you know like we just started writing everything so I feel like uh, a lot of times, um, like a metro environment uh, for a band, 
be a bit of a, a limit or a hindrance in some way because you're whether you like it or not you're indirectly influenced by what's around you and and i feel like those bands are almost too analytically influenced by everything around them like they're thinking too much about what is cool and uh i don't think we had any of that in our way so it's just it felt like experimentation but it also was just completely riotous fun you know like i felt like the more the merrier and and also, it makes us very, it made us um, very stand by me ish, where we were really uh, not insulated or, or exclusive to each other, but we we could have fun in a Walmart parking lot, you know, like yeah. we were we were a show if nobody was there, you know, like totally, or at least for another band, you know. Um, yeah, it was you, it was and, it, uh, it was you guys against the world, and like not in like you said an elitist way, but just like dude, we're we're here no matter what, so let's do this. Right. Yeah, it was kind of you against the world. But I think there was enough of us, too, where there was almost somebody for everybody in terms of getting along <laughs> with people we stayed with, sure. people we ran into and met. So I feel like there, there, we, we, weren't, we weren't inclusive or, or, you know what I mean? We weren't, we weren't too cool for you ever. Yeah. Like, as a matter of fact, I feel like we were very, we brought in as many other people as possible too just just to make the circus as crazy as possible you know when you visit arizona time is measured in moments not minutes like the moment your work stress disappears as you kayak through the canyons or the moment you discover the life-changing effects of prickly pear chocolate but nothing beats the moment you see the grand canyon for the very first time Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com. iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2. A lot of people now actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, <gasps> run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash Bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We even want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought you wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, man. Get out of here. But by get out of here, I mean get in here because you need to learn about Casper. They are a sleep brand that continues to absolutely revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. There's three mattress models, the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential. And the mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention, the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the entire night. And it's delivered right to your door in a small, how the heck do they do that size box with free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. The best part is you can be sure of your purchase with a 100-night Casper. Try it or love it. Guarantee. There's no risk whatsoever. After all, you spend one-third of your life sleeping, so you should absolutely be comfortable. 
I have a Casper and I could not love it more. I have Casper pillows. I have Casper sheets. This stuff, this stuff, this mattress changed my life in the best way possible. And I want to give you $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash words and using words at checkout. That's casper.com slash words. The offer code is words for $50 off your match purchase. If you're ever questioning things, just words, okay? Words is how we're doing this. <laughs> Terms and conditions, of course, apply. But this blew my mind. Casper's the real deal. I love them so, so much. If I could outfit my entire house, just like walking on Casper mattresses, I would. A lot of people would probably find me a little bit weird, but then they would lay down. They'd be like, no, I see what it is that you're doing. So casper.com slash words, $50 off your first mattress purchase. Okay. Now let's go back to the show. You know, as you started to, uh, you know, you and your brother started to get into, you know, all these weird subcultures and playing in bands and all that stuff. Um, you know, did your, you know, were your parents basically just like, oh my gosh, like what, what the hell are these kids into? Like, this is so weird. I don't know how to take this. Or did they kind of generally just Mm -hmm. like leave you alone? I think it was sort of a, um, okay. Picture the whole environment, at least me and Mike were in Mm -hmm. where, uh, my mom's an angel and she, I trust me. I, I don't think she would just let these things happen to, to me and Mike, but, um, but some of it was just out of her control and, and she realized it did. So when we became like pretty much 16 year olds or whatever, you know, we left the house. Like I, I, I didn't either. Both of us got sent to fucked up schools, you know, like little alternative schools. And, and I think, um, you know, uh, and I had to drive, you know, I had a car at that point and I had to drive to, uh, you know, 30 minutes to get to school and, and I'd show up sometimes I ended up actually getting my degree, but my brother never did. And neither one of us really, you know, I think we got really into music and then just kind of disappeared or whatever. And I think we did a couple of shows at the house and they were, you know, <laughs> they're like, ah, you know, like, like a classic, uh, they're not like, you know, they weren't into like discord records when they were, you know, teenagers or anything. Right, right. They're pretty square. Um, I, it, my mom has always been like, whatever makes you happy. But to this day, she's never been a sh- to a show, you know, and after, I don't know, I think me and Mike tried to figure out how many shows we played, but close to a thousand shows. And after all these shows, she's, <laughs> she's uh, never been to a show. Me. And yeah. even though she, you know, she, she she loves pygmy wash and you know is capable of bragging to all of her work friends when she was still working about her uh, her son's band because it's not screaming at you. Uh, but but uh, you know uh, yeah I mean they they've been cool but we didn't really I think she kind of gave us sort of like the <laughs> freedom to be out of the house you know to right. get away from the home thing. Sure. And she worried and stuff, but she kind of understood like it was either fight us and have us hate her too or something, or just let us go. Right. And we kind of just stayed out. And that was kind of, I think me and Mike, like we're engines for a lot of bands that we did. Cause we just didn't have, you know, we weren't, we weren't tied up too much by school or, um, you know, rules or, or, uh, discipline and shit. But yeah, you, right. You guys, so we, we, you guys can push forward on this, right? Right. Availability is one of the best abilities. Right. <laughs> it's very true. It's very, no, it's very true. Um, it's some, something else I noticed about, yeah, you know, page 99 and, you know, a, a lot of the bands that y- you guys were either touring with or, you know, kind of kindred spirits with was, you know, and, and I guess this happens, you know, many times throughout independent music where it's like, you know, you have, you know, these coexisting scenes, uh, you know, within the punk and hardcore where it's like, you know, clearly you guys did not identify with a lot of the, you know, whatever the metal core stuff that was happening on, you know, larger, you know, hardcore labels that were, you know, playing, you know, many of the same venues that you guys were playing, but you know, you either, you know, wouldn't play with them just because you didn't get booked in the same show or whatever. Um, or you're just like, well, that's not really our scene, so to speak. Um, did you, I guess, kind of feel that division or was it basically just like, uh, we're, we're doing our thing. We're fine over here. Uh, was it tangible back then? I'd, I'd say, but it depends on where you draw your line. I mean, bands like, uh, 
earth crisis and, and hate breed and shit were definitely from another world, but we ended up playing with both of them. And, you know, some of our members loved like certain songs, you know, like we're big into shit like that. But I mean, a whole mess of us, I can't speak for myself, but like Corey and Mike and Johnny love like Coalesce, Ink and Dagger, Botch, like Dead Guy, Kill, Kiss It Goodbye, like all of the, you know, almost this is a technical um, and well-produced like, like alternative metal or whatever you want to call it, I guess, power vine, whatever it was called back then. Mm-hmm. But then there's all these metal, you know, almost more contemporaries like Dillinger and, uh, um, uh, I mean, we were fans of Converge, you know, before we played with them and, and, and knew those guys or whatever, but it's funny. I feel like the majority of that stuff really, like, I think who our kindred spirits were, were, you know, at least in our mind, just like us, like down to earth, uh, not fucking popular, not like, um, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, nerdy weirdos or you know those who we those who we ended up being like friends and doing little tours with and playing the most shows and then i think as we started playing because when we first started it was so tangibly you know everything was very set you know darkest hour was like a almost a like a youth crew hardcore band then like that there was just a whole scene of of hardcore in dc that was like you know, jump around and spin kicks and shit. And, uh, that was definitely way different. So we knew we weren't that, you know, but, and, and then we'd be playing a lot of grindcore stuff, like, you know, with just crusty as fuck people, you know, like classic scrogs and, and, um, and they, you know, that it's funny. They're a little nicer and less uptight. And, and also, you know, just in general, like, uh, like more our speed it's not a bit you know i don't know i felt more akin to like crust punks and shit like that like tragedy and and all the grindcore stuff because it, it just felt like a like a world that seemed more like ours but then you know our own world started coming up where orchids and and you know like uh you know uh jerome's dreams and blood brothers and like there's just a whole world of of kind of freak out like spastic as fuck like mixing everything together bands and and you know i think it's weird because like everybody started just taking all of what was available and mixing it together at the same time and we were just one of them doing them doing it one certain way and but you know i mean there's always even to this day there's i was just in a band that like tried so hard to be fucking shoegaze like and uh <laughs> i mean you could still just pick a genre and try to play it but um i i I think more, and people did that back then. It was like, okay, we're fucking youth crew hardcore. Okay, we're grindcore. We're crust punk. We're tech mathcore. Whatever the fuck the the the, the IT nerds are into. Like, you know, um, you, you could still do that today, and people do. And I, I don't know if there's one difference or another, but I think my our crew has always leaned a little bit away from. It's just less interesting to take a template and right over top of it, it's like tracing or something than it is to, you know, like, you know, tweak things like we, you know, we did or whatever. So, yeah. no, it, but it the scenes, the scenes were, they were, they were definitely mixed, you know, like they were, they were playing similar shows and, and, um, and, and I think everybody was nice to each other for, for the most part, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think any of us hated it. I think we goofed off about, you know, like, some of the tough, tougher hardcore bands and made fun of them. But, you know, yeah. I mean, we they're, they're easy targets. So. They're easy targets. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, now we're really, it's now, uh, uh, you know, I get broken up with two days before uh, Valentine's day. And, and I, and I see like the most, the, the thing I can't get away from on the internet is like a meme about a Valentine's meme about my band. So now, yeah. Now we're just real. No, just so meta. Real easy targets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny. It's like, and everyone's like, "Ha ha!" Do you see this? I'm like, "Yeah." It's, it's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but no, I, I mean, right. I'm saying that in good fun. Yeah. So. No. No. I understand what you're saying. Um, 
you know, I, and you, 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 you know, you did bring up an interesting point I was going to make a little bit later in regards to, um, you know, the, you guys were successful in the fact that, you know, you were able to put out records, you were able to tour, you were able to, you know, put one foot in front of the other, so to speak. Um, but then as things started to become, you know, uh, ostensibly more serious, as far as, like you said, you know, there's all of a sudden labels are talking to bands that had no sort of quote unquote commercial appeal in the past. And like, I, I so remember, uh, you know, being from Southern California and, you know, like you mentioned, the blood brothers, they came down all the time. And I remember, they uh this place called Coos Cafe in Santa Ana. Um I don't think you guys mm-hmm. I remember. Yeah. So and you know, you got Ross Robinson, you know, producer extraordinaire showing up at Coos Cafe in Santa Ana to watch the Blood Brothers like, you know, I mean granted I think this story is blown out of proportion because people were like, Oh yeah, he pulled up in like a limo and it's like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. But, um, but anyways, the point being was like all of a sudden these things started to happen. Um, did you guys feel kind of any of the, the, I don't, I don't want to use the word trappings, but like any of the, um, you know, interest from, you know, labels and all that other stuff kind of starting to, you know, peek its head around what you guys were doing. Um, Hmm. I think somewhere this is this is a long I could a long answer to this, but I kind of don't. I think somewhere around um, document eight, um, things that like contemporaries that we admired or or um, you know were readily uh, consuming uh, started to um, be easier to access, and and we started to be introduced to more people. Um, that we, you know, admire or whatever, but, um, but I would say by and large, our entire existence was devoid of any like hype or buzz or anything. I think Travis from Usurp Synap said some ridiculous shit about our, um, our last song at more than music fest being like the, you know, that's it. You know, you guys don't even have to write another song. That's, that's the one, you know, that's gonna blah, blah, blah. But, uh, but that was like literally the only hype I can remember. <laughs> it's like Travis after our show being like, oh, that, 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 that's, that's the ticket. It. You guys are going to blow up. Um, but, uh, you know, it, honestly, we, I don't think we really ever did. I think we got the, you know, because of our touring or whatever, we were in that, in that early, you know, early, uh, two thousands, uh, late nineties punk sense. Like we were, at least a commodity in that, you know, you get this band on your bill and it's going to bring some people out or whatever like that. But I don't, I don't, we never really got any, um, there wasn't any trappings. There wasn't labels chasing after us. We established a relationship with, uh, with two labels or, you know, more than two, but, um, with Andy Lowe uh, almost immediately. And Andy just, was one of those guys that he's just so on it that you didn't really have a chance to look anywhere else. Or I think in the early days we sent, we sent, uh, <laughs> demos around and we all circled around, uh, God, who was the label? It might've been fuck relapse or, um, mm-hmm. it was, I forget what label it was. It was, it wasn't vermiform. It might've been cooler than relapse, but I, I can't re- recall, but, they gave us a rejection letter and we had it, you know, pinned <laughs> up on the wall. That's amazing. And, um, and, uh, all used to make fun of it, but, but, but also like, I think it was promising too. Cause it was, a it was a full on review of the band. And I was like, wow, you know, they thought about it that much. Wow. That's fucking cool. But, uh, you know, like we were all excited about that, you know, and it was a rejection letter. So I would just say, you know, you know, no, I, I would say maybe there was some pressure by the time, we got to Europe and, and, and right before we broke up that I think that was kind of, you know, we broke up as soon as we started feeling that. Cause like people in Europe were like, I think they had a different idea about us. Um, uh, I, I think they thought we were more, um, academically ac- activistic or whatever, or, you know, we were, we were more, um, learned w- with our, with our resistance or whatever, but mm-hmm. uh, instead we were, we were just angry, you know, kids, but, uh, angry kids that, uh, lived life like a bunch of idiots, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't think of it as, I don't really think of us as like 
being necessarily a bunch of drunks. I mean, we definitely drank a lot, but, uh, you know, I, but I think anyway, you know, over there, I think we, we got the impression that there were some things expected of us. And that was kind of the first time it felt like a trapping of who we were was, was, or who we were as a band was, um, incoherent with, uh, you know, like, uh, who we were as people. And I think that only happened there and, and then we just stopped playing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it yeah. Didn't, didn't really right manifest itself. iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2. A lot of people now actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash Bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We even want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought you wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... (laughs) (laughs) Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you crave a good mystery? Tune in to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast featuring episodes of different detective dramas from the golden age of radio every day Monday through Saturday. The lineup of radio detectives currently includes Sam Spade, Dr. Tim Detective, Dangerous Assignment, Philo Vance, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar, and Tales of the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Adam Graham, and I offer commentary and humor after each episode and also respond to your questions and feedback. Enjoy a good mystery before bed, while driving, or whenever you crave old-school radio goodness. Listen to the great detectives of old-time radio on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, you want to become better at marketing, right? Like, whether it's marketing your band, whether it's marketing your graphic design, whatever it is, Check out this class. This class is called Sell It Without Selling Out, DIY Marketing for Creatives. It is taught by a good friend of mine, a previous guest in the show, Finn McKenty and Matt Halpern, another previous guest in the show, the drummer for Periphery. It is a step-by-step guide for designers, artists, all the creative people that listen to this show to market themselves and get paid to do what they love. It's everything those two dudes have learned from the past 15 years of experience, which trust me, they have a ton of experience and like, not just like fake experience that, you know, padding your resume and stuff like that. Because these guys have done it. You'll get 18 videos on each step of the marketing process, plus a 50 page workbook that will guide you through the process of making your own marketing plan. And best of all, lifetime access to their private coaching group where they'll do weekly live check-ins to answer questions in real time and guide you through the process. Sell it without selling out.com. There's a couple of videos there. You can dive in, get a little sample of it. I can't back this thing enough. If you are just slightly interested in marketing, you will find a lot of awesome, awesome nuggets. It's not like you're going to remember everything. You're going to remember like two to four things and be like, wow, those are really good principles. So go to that website, 
sell it without selling out.com. All right. Now on with the show. Um, and, and kind of on that same topic of the, you know, the idea of, you know, the music business and stuff like that, you know, how like, you know, because you guys need, you know, were getting, you know, paid to play shows and, you know, you were existing in the DIY touring ecosystem, you know, was the, the I guess the kind of business of the band, something that, you know, was uh, kind of not, not a necessary evil, but was something that, you know, you guys, you know, paid attention to and you, you, you took care of, but uh, was that like a total, just like complete afterthought where it's like, all right, whatever. Like, well, as long as we have money to, you know, put in the gas tank and, you know, eat some food, then like we're okay. Or was there, you know, like, I guess kind of intentionality behind, um, you know, a what savvy, well, uh, maybe not even a savvy, but just like, you know, the decisions were made where it's like, all right, well, I guess we'll play this show because, you know, like, Oh wow, there's, you know, they're going to pay us a thousand dollars to drive, you know, 2000 no, miles or something. No, okay. never. I, okay. <laughs> no, I, I think, I, I think by and large, like we're, we were, uh, you know, we were a feedback loop. We would just, we would, we would take the money we got and feed it right back into merch or, or gas tank or something like that. I think Andy Lowe was literally like for a couple of years, another member of the band. Cause he did, he did kind of, it's almost Warren Buffett as, you know, like he, he was a team, he was a team member and he, he was promotional minded, business minded, uh, you know, like literally, you know, he, his, his merch, I call it his merch table for page on nine. Cause we didn't have it until he was like, okay, I'm going to do all this shit. And then, uh, and then when he wasn't on our tours, we didn't have, any, you know, like we had a handful of shirts, handful of things, but when Andy was on a tour, we had hats, we had lighters, we had, you know, matchbooks, we had like, you know, just dumb shit. Like he was just like, you know, anything you could think of to make, to throw a page I nine logo on, you did. And, you know, it was fun. Um, and, and the merch, merch table was like a little Walmart. He was doing like combos and, and shit like that, like a, a little McDonald's over there. But, and, uh, I think that it, quite honestly, Andy made a good living for himself. He was a smart businessman and, uh, moved to New Zealand and, um, you know, has a, a handful of, uh, little rug rats and, and a wife over there and, and he's doing good. I'm not saying like, you know, we're, we, uh, like he, he took us for anything. He just basically off of page I nine and a few other, uh, bands on his label, he just made a really lucrative business for himself and, and basically retired. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, that said, we've always been really bad with money, at least me and Mike. And, you know, I don't know if any of the labels i've been uh, ever been on are going to hear this but i don't get any quarterly reports or royalties for <laughs> right. any of the records and um you know it, over the years in my later years i i've struggled actually a little bit with some of the old page i9 label um label owners just just to try to get them to you know like send send this along send send me a quarterly or something because like as i've gotten older and the you can, i can see the influence has expanded or whatever and and, uh, you know, after the best friends day stuff, it's just sort of like, well, you know, it's not that we ever wanted to make money off of this, but are we being really irresponsible or what? Cause it just seems like everybody else around us is, I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, people are making bootleg, you know, enamel pens and just, you know, cool shit that if we, I guess we're smart about it, we would be making this stuff and like a, you know, misfits fan club type of way, but we're, we're just not like that. We're, if it has nothing to do with the music and the band's not around anymore, it's just not there, but revisiting it, uh, time to time, you know, I always, I always go in my head right back to like, well, shit, you know, like, I wonder if there's any unpaid, you know, stuff, I, you know, maybe my brother gets all this stuff and I don't, uh, I don't, um, you know, I don't ever see it because he's just sort of like, you know, oh, cool. And then just like, you know, it doesn't feel the need to tell the whole band about it because we're all in New York and California and, you know, all over the place. So he's like, you know, probably not feeling the urge to, okay, guys, uh, we have a dollar fifty nine and uh, royalties. How do you guys want to divvy this up, you know, or something? So, uh, you know, by and large, I don't think, you know, um, I don't think we're very good at it or ever were, you know, I don't think actually we've ever gotten a leg up or ahead. Bands these days are way more smart about like even valuing yourself. I guess I, you know, part of me is like confused about the, 
<laughs> how it's supposed to work. I thought I knew. I thought you just love music and you just go out and do it. And um, you don't need to get paid because the payment is in the, in the personality dissolution or, uh, you know, cathartic uh, uh, kinetic therapy or whatever. But, uh, but apparently the young kids uh, feel entitled to a, a working wage out of it. And, you know, good for them. I, I, I've had conversations with Johnny, Page Johnny Young's drummer about it a lot, you know, like, you know, uh, the kind of work we put in, people don't realize you get back from a tour. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I d- was doing that condo maintenance job, you get back from that tour. And, oh, how was vacation? And I'm like, Oh, let me tell you what my vacation's like. Uh, you get up at around eight o'clock you get coffee, but you don't get food because you don't have time. When you drive for eight hours and your butt and ass and legs sort of numb up because you've just been sitting on them all day. And then you get out like a moving company, unload somewhere around a ton or in a ton and a half of equipment. Then you fucking sweat, you perform, you go through the literal, uh, you know, like emotional, um, roller coaster of, uh, of, uh, being vulnerable in front of, uh, you know, 20 to 40 people or something. And then <clears throat> you take your, your, um, you know, like hundred bucks from the door and you fill up your tank and you fill, you, you load up all your stuff this time drunk. So you do your moving company bit again, but you do it drunk and it's a, probably somewhere around one thirty AM. And then you go to bed uh, probably around three o'clock because you're hanging out with a bunch of people and you wake up at eight and you do it all over again. It's fucking not vacation. It's hard. And if you don't like have the energy to do it or somebody's not giving you a bunch of money and like, you know, uh, 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 validation through, you know, attention or whatever, uh, you're not going to want to do it. So I commend anybody that goes, fuck it. I'm going to be a musician and, uh, I commend them for demanding some money, uh, about it too. But, uh, I just never did it that way. It's not that I think it's, bad or anything you know maybe it is uh, but i've never done it that way i've never like chased a check for for music you know and i'm not saying it's bad but i i just i don't i don't relate to it um maybe 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 we should have i don't know but it's it's all water under the bridge i suppose yeah well it's i mean it is interesting i appreciate you kind of laying out all your thoughts like that because there is that notion especially now. And I, I'm sure, you know, you've witnessed this and it kind of, you know, leads into a po- question I was going to ask in a, you know, a little bit in regards to, you know, bands, you know, music is always cyclical and certain styles of music, you know, take whatever five to 10 years to seep into, you know, the cultural consciousness. And then all of a sudden those bands that broke up many years ago, don't, you know, people are, are in love with them, but, you know, clearly never had a chance to either see them or, you know, realize that they played to like 40 people most nights or whatever, which, you know, is right. arguably page 99's experience as well. And so yeah, the, the you know, I, I'm sure it was interesting, like, you know, as you guys started to play shows again and start to, you know, get out there in the, you know, more modern uh, ecosystem of, you know, music and the kind of, I wouldn't call it revisionist history, but the way that people view, you know, page 99 now, you know, clearly like you could have never anticipated, you know, when you guys stopped playing in the early two thousands, um, you know, so is it kind of weird to wrestle with that legacy kind of tying in with what you're talking about too, where it's just like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, we, we made, you know, negative $400 a piece in the band. Like, you know, how does that all, I, I yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's but like I, mean, my, I, I wake up in the morning to check my text mes- messages and it says minus one. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> right yeah nobody not even nobody yeah like one text message got taken away <laughs> uh <laughs> right but i mean like that's I, a great uh I, i'm sure it's weird for you to like i said kind of wrestle around with that legacy of like okay well you know like we, clearly we were never a band for money ever like that wasn't the thing or we were never a band to be popular but now that you know this is this soil that we have um you know made fertile so to speak is now you know paying dividends and then also all these bands exist because you know they took pages from our influence and stuff and so yeah i was just curious kind of like 
how you've been able to process that or if you're still just processing it as we speak. Um, it's funny cause I feel like, uh, you know, I have different conversations with, with different members about the same thing, uh, a good amount. And, you know, um, and that, you, you know, it's true. You, you know, at these reunion shows, I think a lot of the impression people had is that, you know, we were this big when, when we existed and people don't realize, yeah, we, we played to like 25 people, 40 people most nights, but um, and d- did enjoy like a robust scene that had tons of good shows too, but it wasn't because of us, you know, like, um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, after that, you know, I, I think the overarching, uh, impression all of us have with it is it's kind of, you know, it's funny. I think we, if me and Mike, when we first started, we're like, man, if we could just, if we could just be some other kids born again, like, to, like the way that band was to us, like that would be, make us happy. And I feel like that's exactly what we did. Like we're, we're not huge. We're not, you know, but there, we, we imparted some thing about music that, that sticks with people. And no, it's, it, it's, it's funny. I, uh, it, it's definitely beyond the scope I, I could have ever really thought of. Cause it, it really is far reaching. I mean, it, every, it just, just in the art world alone, like all these people sending me tattoos and, and, um, and these amazing artists like re- relaying to me, like people that I'm like, good God, you're like a million years better than I like uh, relaying to me that I had some hand in there um, and them doing their pin work or whatever. It just blows my mind. I guess it's a testament to how fucking old I am and how long, me and my brother and the rest of us have kind of stuck, stuck with this lifestyle or whatever. But, um, but I think, um, by and large what's going on or, you know, and, and as far as the money's concerned, I mean, it, I wouldn't have done this last tour if, if it was for, for money, you know, like, but we, I mean, let's contrast it. You know, we made negative 400 as a band and, uh, uh, in the early two thousands and then, 2017 we made 50 grand in seven days and gave it all away <clears throat> and i just feel like that that's just exactly us like i feel like and i feel like that show or the, that tour uh, especially like um re-fortified like my my you know like my uh conviction my belief that like what what music really is supposed to be about here is is a community um, of people that are accessible, like, uh, and, and, and inclusive, you know, like it's supposed to be a community where, where that band that everybody just danced to, you can go have a beer with, or you could talk to, you can approach them. They're, you know, they're, they're artists working on the, and, and the same, you know, like they're working artists, but like they're, um, they're sharing, they're sharing what they do. You know, they're, you know, it just, it just seemed like more like that. Like, like, and I think just, just, uh, on the premise that there wasn't money being made by the band. Uh, and we didn't, I mean, even the bands we played with, we told them, you know, you're not going to get paid that much, you know, like we can give you like a hundred bucks or something, but they did it anyway. And I just think that, you know, so all the bands got behind it. And so the whole, and I think people um, donated more too, like per show. It just felt like a strength, strengthening thing. I think honestly, the only thing regretful about the whole thing was that like we have so much um, influence and like you know, in other words, or lack of a better word, we so much um, power uh, nowadays with this band that we could really do some damage in terms of like st- strengthening like the marginalized part of our community. Uh, and I think that's like, that's a, per, you know, it's, it's a grown ups purpose when, when you're 18 or 20 and you're just jumping in a van with your friends, there's some, some sort of like formative solidifying of your, of your, you know, um, recognition that people are important and that like, uh, and that good friends and good connections are important and that, a group, a, gr- uh, 
a group trajectory where everybody's got a, a, a goal they're all headed towards and where they set the intention for it. And then they just let go of outcome or expectation. I mean, how did we know this Buddhist ass philosophy when we were 20 years old, you know, like how did we just not expect anything from it? And, uh, you know, like reap such a great reward from it. And I just feel like, uh, I, I actually think like, uh, our best, you know, you know, our, I, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a shame that we can't do, you know, we can't do this. And I think majority roles kind of taking that, you know, and, and to some degree uh, in a personal way, like empowering themselves. Um, cause I think all of us get older and we struggle kind of, you know, in this lifestyle, like what the fuck, you know, okay, should I have done college? Should I have kids right now? Should I have this house or, or whatever? Some of us do. Some of us were a little smarter than others, but uh, you know, I think a lot of us do kind of question that even those of us with kids and houses, like, should I have done that? Or should I have been playing music? And, and I just think recently for all of us at this age and everything, that tour is just empowering and, um, and a way to show us that, you know, like, uh, playing music because it, it does something for, it empowers you or your community is like, it's just the kind of the, it's kind of the best way to do it. You know, like I, I know there's, you know, it, it, I'm not going to tell like uh fucking Tom Waits to only do benefit shows or something, but right. uh, you, right. you know, there's some people that belong there, but what, you know, we grew, we, we basically, uh, we owe everything to like DIY and, and we owe everything to the fact that for a few short years in the early two thousands, people lost their fucking mind when we played. And, and even if there was 20 people, people that really did, you know, it was a group environment. It was incredibly uh, cathartic for the whole room. It was a community thing. We would, we play this dumb game out in the parking lots. We called it Glido where we'd take a bottle or a cup and try to keep it aloft like a volleyball or something. You had to yell Glido before you hit it. (laughs) And it just, we just made fools out of ourselves and everybody who wanted to join us at, in every parking lot for like three years. And it was just sort of a thing. Some people were like Gainesville Glido chapter and they, and they made patches, <laughs> but you know, like it, it was just dumb. But the idea is that like, you know, we're, this is dumb, you know, like we're all a bunch of fucking silly kids playing, you know, like, you know, it was just like a, something about, um, money i guess makes everything very serious and and the stakes are way higher and i just kind of hate that if music gets so high stakes and serious it's just really boring and and i feel like uh you know it's okay like if it quite honestly if if uh if somebody was like come out to europe play this festival for this amount of money and if everybody was like i want to do it and i want to do it for the money and it'll be fun and it'll be an experience. I do it, but I, uh, I just don't, you know, I don't, it's funny cause the, the, the band is literally something that like, I think a lot of bands try to get to, but it's uh, a bit for the wrong reasons. Like uh, I think people, I don't, I don't think any of us thrive off of the attention. I don't think any of us, um, you know, like I think we're, we, we had each other, so I don't think we needed a whole bunch of approval. And, uh, and so that element that I think a lot of bands latch on to is, is, it's just not needed, even though it's there. And, um, and I've been in other bands and I've, I've seen like, you know, they just want it so bad. They just want people to like them or whatever. And I don't know. I feel like that's the way you get somebody not to give a shit or something or, or, you know, or you just worry so much or you're so serious. You can't have fun up there. And look, if, if I'm watching a band and somebody's too uptight to like, let their music speak to me, I'm, you know, if their body's getting in the way because they're like fucking holding it in or like concentrating or haven't figured out how to like use music in a cathartic way. And it's, I could lose interest. Yeah. Unless it's like my bloody Valentine or something. And they're just standing there like statues, but the, they figured something out and their pedals are singing to me or something. But you know, uh, by and large, if I see a band, you know, it's, it's written all over their face if they want to be there or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's the thing. Like, uh, 
all you guys, all you bands out there, if you're even listening to this, uh, you know, you're trying real hard to get people to like you or to buy your record or anything, try harder to enjoy yourself and try harder to like fucking uh, build and like camaraderie and chemistry with your friends. And then you'll, and enjoy that, but play music at the same time. And you won't need everyone to like you, you know, you won't need a bunch of money either. Yeah. I, that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. It'll just, it, it'll, it'll pay itself in ways that, um, you know, in human capital, as opposed to the capital that is fleeting, you know? So the, um, right. And in, in our case, perhaps later down the road, you know, like, you know, somebody will make a stupid meme about your band on Valentine's Day and it'll make you feel like shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, who knows? Your legacy, you know, your like, legacy can ch- can shape in so many different ways. <laughs> yeah, it could be a it could be a punchline on a on a day that you feel like you just didn't need that. But regardless, <laughs> uh, no, I think that's really funny. Yeah, uh, but regardless, you know, yeah, I, I don't, it, I don't think you should ever get into something with the the end goal specifically determined. And then you don't get to enjoy what actually ends up happening. You'll be disappointed at almost de facto if 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 your if your goal is so specific that anything short of it is going to be underwhelming, you know. Yeah. But if you leave it wide open, whatever happens kind of is novel and hilarious, or you know, at least interesting. You yeah. Know? No, absolutely. Um, the last thing I want to hit on was you know specifically your art, like you mentioned, the fact that. You know, it clearly it was incorporated in a lot of, you know, what the band was doing. And then, you know, you, like you mentioned, you know, you, you kind of were, you know, forced to leave it kind of stagnant for a while. But, you know, you've recently started to engage again, you know, with the world at large as far as like, oh, yeah, here's the stuff. And actually, it's funny because I worked at uh, Century Media slash Abacus Recordings when we put out that Planes Mistaken for Stars LP. Um, oh, so shit. I th- so you I th- did the graphic work? Well, no, I, I worked at the label. I, I signed the band. And so I think yeah. I, I want to say you and I may have traded emails around that time because I, I remember getting the art <laughs> files and stuff like that. But um, anyway, <laughs> oh, shit. yeah, it's funny. It's a small, it's a small world when you're talking about small world. Art, that's for sure. <laughs> no. Um, but um you know i I'm, I'm guessing that you know your uh, you know reinvigoration with the fact that you know you're re-engaging with your art is pretty exciting uh just because the fact that you you know you can carve out that time for yourself and then you know people seem to be responding positively to it like they had when you were putting it out there originally mm-hmm. yeah no it, it uh like we, we started everything cyclical. It was still, like we started this conversation. It, it, you know, like it was, um, it was brewing. It, it had been talked about, you know, my brother was getting on my case, like, man, you know, like, cause we're struggling with music stuff and, um, just carving out time to do music. And he's like, man, if I were you, I would just, I mean, you don't need anybody else to do art. I would just, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's been on my case about it, you know, do this, do that. Uh, I don't know why you don't like, um, look at this guy, look at that guy They're you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I don't know that, that happened. That's been going on for like two years or something, you know, like probably just, just as pygmy lush has slowed down and I've had more time, but, um, um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, something just clicked and, um, I decided to to not work until this works out, you know, like, um, you know, I don't, I'm not good at any of this as I just described, you know, throughout this conversation, I'm not a good business person. I'm even when I did contracting and, and side jobs, I'm terrible at, at, at asking people for money, <laughs> you know, like, uh, but, um, I, uh, I've talked to a couple of mentors, some really impressive artists, um, uh, and, uh, that, that en- enjoy my work and, um, yeah, got some advice and, and really kind of like filled in all of the blanks of, of what I was, I've been missing over the years. I've done a lot of stuff for a bunch of bands and, and, uh, and spurts have made money, but it, you know, it's always been more of a hustle than it is like a, like, a like a job or anything. And, um, I don't know. I like, uh, carved out a little corner in my room and, uh, put a table in and, and, you know, a little light box and a radio 
and it's just really nice. I start at 12. I meditate for about 30 minutes and I start drawing and it's just music and drawing until five o'clock. And, uh, I take the weekends off like a normal person. And, um, it's just cool. I feel, I feel like, you know, I've always drawn and I've always been, um, a decent illustrator, but never really, I think, uh, part of it was our high school didn't have an art class. So like I, I kind of got into graffiti and kind of got away, I got into spray paint and away from, um, away from illustration or whatever. And then really just did after that only did art, any kind of art when a band, when one of my bands needed it, you know, and at that, it wasn't really artistic. It was more design, you know? And, um, so just within like, you know, like a month or something, I'm like, I feel like I've taken like a illustration course or something. I'm like gobbling up, uh, people's, um, people's uh time lapse drawings uh people i admire and and just seeing their techniques and stuff like that and I, I feel like i've picked up more stuff in a month than i have you know working every day than i have in gosh like all all of these years and and it it's been really cool because like it's already innate like i already uh i've always been able to like spatially recognize things and 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 draw. So it's really cool getting all these techniques to back it up or whatever. And, but I'm still very, like very, you know, new to it. And, uh, you know, I mean, my, um, my catalog goes in so far as like a handful of pig destroyer records, the page giant iron art, you know, planes, a handful of t-shirts, you know, and a couple of bands here and there, but I mean, maybe like ultimately like maybe 30, 30 band related pieces or whatever. And that's really all I have to my name. So I got a lot of catching up to do, <laughs> yeah. but I'm loving it. It's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's been, um, it's been the thing where, you know, like every, every job teaches you a little bit of something more or something, every relationship or every band, every experience, you a little bit more of something about yourself. And, and I think all of it, at least, you know, I'm almost 40. So it's all kind of, kind of been you know uh funneling me towards this in a lot of ways and it feels that way it feels like uh all of the answers i didn't have about like oh, how the fuck am i gonna you know get old like what am i gonna do <laughs> like i know i can't go thrashing around the stage the whole time so um that's that's where i'm at and yeah. honestly it, it's it's been fucking cool as hell i uh I feel like I've, it's a lot like music. There's a huge community of really supportive artists, and and uh, I'm just get I'm just jumping right in there and and enjoying ev- you know everybody else's work and being humbled and uh, by by everybody's ability and and uh, hopeful that I can uh, challenge and improve my my own you know. Yeah, your chop, your chop, so to speak. <laughs> no, that's it, yeah. I'm working on my chops. Right? I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, I'm like the Rocky montage stage. Yeah. Of my, uh, <laughs> I love my, that. I'm doing like the yeah, the, the, push, uh, the push-ups, the, the running. Four, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's in the snow. It's, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's it's been really great. And um, you know, I've got a handful of commissions. I've got a Iron Reagan uh, uh, design just about finished up uh this cool band um from over here uh wrist meets razor i'm gonna do their lp i'm excited about that because that'll be the first lp in a while and uh, a handful of other little projects uh portrayal of guilt on the horizon um some other other cool stuff but i'm just i'm stoked i'm like booked till till mid-may basically nice man that's awesome well that's uh that's really cool well, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time, Chris. This has been super fun for me and I really appreciate your, um, your insight and your, your thought process. So you're a, you know, you're a smart guy and I appreciate you expressing yourself. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you, uh, reaching out and it's my pleasure to, to talk with you. You know, it, it's always, a it's always, a humbling to, um, realize somebody wants to hear about all this stuff you know <laughs> so uh thanks for your support and you know even if it's, if you hadn't gotten to see us uh sit tight we it, it's not necessarily over yet but uh oh, oh i don't I w- know exactly uh, when i was i i was fully expecting that i mean i know that i know that majority rule is plans to come out here so i was i was not going to be surprised to see uh if you guys made an announcement at some point being like oh yeah we're, we haven't forgot about you west coast Oh my.
I thought was a marathon, wasn't it? In the best way possible, though. Like, you know how you feel after you've run a marathon? I'm just kidding. I've never run a marathon. But, uh, you know, maybe after you've you've done, you know, a pretty strenuous workout, you played some basketball or whatever, and how you kind of feel that, that runner's hive, endorphins, that's what I hope you feel right now, where you're like, hell yeah, I'm inspired to create something. I'm inspired to just be active in my music community. Because after all, that is why this show exists. I believe in it so greatly that this medium... And these conversations will hopefully inspire you, will inspire other people to start podcasts and basically create your own art off of this thing. Or even if you've never heard this podcast, then you're not listening to this. So that's irrelevant. But anyways, that's what I want out of this show. And 300 episodes in, I'm still extremely fired up about what this is, what this could be, how meaningful it is to many people. And it's not lost on me. Like, I still feel... um, I don't know, just like, I I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) But then when people circle back and say, oh man, you've, you know, you've got a good show. I really respect it. I'm like, that's, that's absolutely incredible. And, uh, what do we have next week? Episode 301. Keep on trucking, right? I have a amazing conversation with an old friend of mine, Howard Jones plays in a band called light this torch also played in a band called kill switch engage and also played in a band called blood has been shed, which is where I first met him played shows together and i've got <clears throat> this it, it is a very fun conversation because we we get into some funny experiences that uh, both of us had together in uh you know just playing shows and staying at users houses and stuff like that so that is what we have next week and uh yeah i'm just so thankful for you find people downloading this thing so yeah until next week please be safe everybody Oh, and big shout outs to So Delicious Organic Almond Milk with Cashew. It's got seven or fewer ingredients, three amazing flavors, nothing else compares. Visit SoDeliciousDairyFree.com slash words. And big shout out to WeTransfer. Go to WeTransfer.com and you can transfer huge files. Super, super easy. I love the service. 40 million people use it. Why aren't you using it? Okay? WeTransfer.com. And now that's the end of the show. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network, jabberjawmedia.com. When the world gets in the way of your music, try the new Bose QuietComfort earbuds too. Next-gen earbuds uniquely tuned to the shape of your ears. They use exclusive Bose technology that personalizes the audio performance to fit you delivering the world's best noise cancellation and powerfully immersive sound so you can hear and feel every detail of the music you love. Bose QuietComfort Earbuds 2. Sound shape to you. To learn more, visit Bose.com.